We are here because we hope that there will be a hunger. That there will be a hunger that will rise inside of you to understand more of what we are talking about. Not only to understand more of what we are talking about, but to become it. To become a minister, an effective minister of the gospel. Through the dispensation of grace God has given to me and Katie Souza on what I believe is absolutely the most important subject the Bible has to tell. You know, that ever since the fall of Adam, the obsession of mankind is idolatry. Even the best of us, at, the, at whatever highest levels of faith. The thing that Idols Right has done for me is brought me to, to terms. It brought me to a place where I could, without being ashamed, accept the fact that as powerful as I am, as many books I've written, as, as much as I love Jesus, I do have some idols. See now, you know, you must understand something. The enemy has done a masterful job of making us ashamed to acknowledge we have idols. Wow. The problem is you cannot be delivered from what you refuse to acknowledge. So what you refuse to acknowledge remains hidden in darkness while those things eat you alive. And yet you're not supposed to tell that you have got idols that are rioting in your soul because what would that make you look like? In a church where everybody fights to look really good when they are dying inside. So you end up with a church of people who are dying. Everybody's dying on the bus, but nobody can say it. Wow. Because somehow the enemy has managed to convince us that, you know, admitting you have an idol is synonymous with saying you don't love Jesus. That's how it used to feel like to me. Wow. Whenever the sort of idolatry would be spoken, I would be squirming in my seat because a part of me felt convicted that I had some idolatry in my life, but the acknowledgement of that terrified me because of what I thought its implications meant. I may not, I may not love Jesus or I may not be as saved as I was. So when, so when idols riot comes into play, God, the first thing God did was bust that bubble and boy, the relief that came through that floodgates. The relief and the deliverance, the healing that has come out of knowing I can talk to Jesus about the idols that are in my life that is known about all along. Now for the first time, I get to tell them I'm addicted to this. I actually think this is higher than you right now. But, but, but I'm surprised that you love me through it because you've been still using me in spite of that knowledge. Your idolatry does not surprise Jesus when you discover it. He knew it before you discovered it. And every testimony you can think about where God showed you grace, loved you through it, he was loving you through your idols. So why are you trying to hide something from somebody who's already known about it before you did? This has been the genius of the devil to allow us to believe if we can hide it from ourselves, maybe we hide it from Jesus too. That's a lie. You see what I'm saying? So what it did for us and it's doing for people. I'm having people said, this is the first time I can go in a church service and I find a bunch of people talk, talk, talking to each other. I have idols. Oh, I have idols too. I have idols. Whoa! <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> Can, you should have been in Nashville. Nashville. Lunch hour was funny. In lunch hour was funny. You know, I mean, people didn't know me here. I was hearing behind them as they are fellowshipping. They are, where are you going to find a charismatic church where people own it? They are eating, they are talking, they are saying like, man, you know what? I've got five idols. I just saw with the five idols. Oh yeah, i got six. You know, the Lord showed me on the And I'm like, and I'm like, Lord, what is this? He says, my children are getting cleaned out. Yeah. They're getting cleaned out. Because yeah. every other place, people hide them. People hide them. She, if demons had their way with men, it is they would love to put us under a gag of silence. Because they work better when we keep quiet. That's why they tell Jesus, leave us alone, because they like to hide in the shadows. So now, Jessica, do you have the... I, I want to talk to you very quickly, in very quickly, on the 12 laws of an altar. 12 laws of what? The reason you need to understand is because then you are going to understand the idols teaching very well. Okay. Amen. Someone said the devil is looking for a dynasty. Say the devil is looking for a dynasty. Now say this, not in my life. 
Do you know that God raises a deliverer for every family? God raises a deliverer for what? Every family. This is why you have been so different from everybody in your family. The deliverer is always the black sheep. The deliverer is always the one hungry for things nobody in the family wants. Because you are the Moses of the family. The reason you are here today on a, on a meeting called Idols Right Healing and Deliverance Services, you did not understand what it was. You are like, but my God. Amen. Come on somebody. But you still came. Something inside of you knew you are supposed to be here. Because every family God raises a Moses. Every family God raises a deliverer. I'm a deliverer for my family. My family is in walking in freedom. Including my father came to Christ because I got born again. You catch what I'm saying? So there's always a Moses. I believe you are here today because you are a deliverer for your bloodline. You are the one who ends the nonsense. You are the one who says the idols and the altars. You are getting out of my family. So help me God. And one after the other, you're going to see your family members. Though, what family, see, here's what happens. When you allow God to make you a deliverer in your family, then you hold the title. See, there's a law in the spirit. Whosoever holds title, he's the one who has a legal right to fight everything, thing, every demon in your bloodline that has held title until you. So that's why God is raising you up. So that you can send out to every demon, okay, I'm going to check. Before you know your mother is free. Before you know it, your father is free. Before you know your, your sister is free. You see what I'm saying? Because it's you, you, you holding the title. And you are the one going, going through the blood and, and kicking butt. Come on, somebody. And getting devils out. That's what we want out of you. So I want you to uh, 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 look at Genesis 126 very quickly. You know, you know Genesis, we know Genesis 126 very quickly. I just want to give you a couple of scriptures. Um, amen. A couple of scriptures, Genesis 126. God said, Let us make man in our image. Remember that? You know, and God said, let, let, You know, yeah, now, amen. Let us, let us, let us, okay. Now, now I want to use, let, God said, Let us, let, let us, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Is that right? Yes. Make what? Mankind in our image after our likeness. Let them have complete authority. Ever say, complete authority. Complete authority means when it comes to authority in the planet earth, God left nothing out on the table, even for himself, it's yours. This is why the lie that God is sovereign is, 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 is God is sovereign, yes, he's sovereign, and yet he's not. <laughs> I'm going to tell you, this is interesting. We have used the sovereignty of God to excuse ourselves from taking responsibility for our complete authority. Let them have complete authority over the fish of the sea, over the beds of the air, the temp, the beast, over all the... Now, the, I want you to look at those words. Ever say, let them. If you have a Bible that is physical, you can even cycle it, let them. But those words are powerful. Ever say, let them. These two words are the most important words God ever spoke on earth. These two words. The most important, absolutely, words God ever spoke to men. Because no words, have, no words changed radically and drastically the relationship between God and man than those two words, let them. Because in letting them, God excludes himself from what he's about to do. If God had said, let them and us, then complete authority would be shared between God and man over the earth. But it's not. God said, let them, male and female. Come on, son, let them. He said, male and female. Come on now. Hello, come on, somebody. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I'm from Africa. I love a lively, I love a lively crowd. <laughs> Next time I come to I come here, I'll bring some African juice. Everybody who comes in, you have to take a shot. It's not a vaccine, but it's an African juice. And they come in, they go, ah! People are like, ah, what? You are so active today. I've got the African juice, man. <laughs> These two words, let them change everything. <clears throat> God chose to use, to ping his sovereignty on those two words. Is God sovereign? Yeah, God is so sovereign, he excluded himself out of complete authority. He chose to use his sovereignty to take himself out. 
That's why when you say God is sovereign, he'll move anywhere. No, if I'm going to move in any area, then I have to find a man. It could be John, it could be Kerry. But I, you know, every time you ask God, every time Israel cried for God to deliver them, God never came himself. He chose to use his sovereignty to raise another vessel who can say yes. So God never uses his sovereignty to break the law, the law he created. See, we want God to use his sovereignty to break the law. He's not the lawbreaker. He upholds the law. Because a king who breaks the law is not a king worth having. And God is king. And in him there is no lie. If he tells you something, he will not break it to make you feel better. Because you are asking a king to break law. The moment he breaks it for you, he breaks it for everybody else. And he's not a king worth having. So every time you cry for a deliverer, God goes to the book of the law, which is his word. And finds what law applied to well, how we can fix this issue. And he says, Lord, according to your own law, you said, let them, in the word of men, you give them complete authority. So if you have to do anything to fix whatever they are broken, you have to raise one of them. <laughs> so God takes 40 years to raise Moses because that's how long it took to raise one of them. So for 40 years, they are still slaves because God is taking 40 years to raise one of them. But he's sovereign. When they are being beaten in, in, in Egypt, you, you think don't, don't, God does not see the weeps? He doesn't see the cries of the children of Israel? He sees them, but even in their tears, God will not break the word. He says, I know you think I don't, I'm not hearing right now, but there's a man on the back side of the desert. He's in exile right now. He's, a, he's, a, he's kind of thick in the skull, so it's taking me 40 years to really prepare him. You think God wanted Moses to come into ministry at the age, 40, at age 80? He had a thick skull. God had to take 40 years to take Egypt out of him and brought him back at 80 to start his ministry. There's hope for all of you. <laughs> tell somebody, tell somebody, there's hope for you. <laughs> the greatest ministry in the Old Testament began at 80. There's hope for all of us. Okay? Let them have complete authority. Let them. Those two words change how God Relates to men. <laughs> it changed how demons and the Satan relate to you. You have more power than you realize. The problem is you have abdicated that power through your passivity and through your religiosity thinking, you know, but you don't understand that both God and the devil desperately need you. Well, God doesn't need me. Yeah, that's say somebody who's doesn't understand God. God says, I, that, you don't read the word. What do you mean God said, I don't need you? I just told you, Ezekiel 22, 30, I looked for a man. <laughs> yeah. I looked for a man to do what? Stand in the gap so I don't, so I don't do what? Destroy the land. Who told you? God doesn't need me. Oh, he needs you. When I was at all, you know these things we say, oh God, you know, you don't need me. God says, shut up, boy, I need you. Just get with the program. <laughs> you think I'm spending all these years trying to change you because I don't need you? Shut up, boy. I need you and real bad. But I'll chase you around town until, I, until one day you say, yes! Because that's how much I need you. Turn to an action and say, God needs you. And, you, and then tell them, but you, but you need them a whole lot. So those two words, let them have dominion. Let them have dominion means God delegates the authority of earth to men. Okay? Making by that one statement, earth the word of men. Say with me, earth, earth. is the word of men. Word of men. Okay? Okay? What does that mean? So now, now, that becomes what is known as the law of dominion. Let, the law of dominion or the law of territory. Let me write, let me write, I want you to write down the law of dominion. If you can write it down or get it on your, hopefully you can write it down. Or get it in your spirit. Amen. Come on somebody. And by the way, this is why I love coming to the school. Because when you come in the school, you are not going to just watch me teach. You're going to have a pen writing. Because that's why I love schools. Because you come not to, to, to be entertained, you come to digest. And that's why I love schools. I love schools more than life conferences. Okay? You know, but here's the bottom line. Write this one down. This is the law of dominion. The law of dominion. Okay? In the law of dominion, the law of dominion simply states this. That spirits without bodies 
Spirits with what? Spirits without bodies are illegal on earth. Spirits without bodies are what? Are illegal on earth. I what? Are illegal on earth and have no authority on earth. And have what? And have no authority on earth unless they are working through a human being. Did you get the Lord Domino now? That's the Lord Domino. Or, or, or it's also called the law of territory. Meaning that ter the earth territory belongs to what? Man. Just like heaven belongs to God. Earth belongs to you. In terms of authority. Not ownership. Ownership is to God's. The earth and the world there belongs to the Lord. It's ownership versus authority. Okay, do, do you get the point? Okay, let me give, give, give you what I mean. Uh, give, give an example. How many, how many have ever rented a house? Okay. Who owns the house? The owner. The owner. But why you, the lease is on and you are paying your bills, you are paying the rent, who has authority? Even the landlord cannot come to your house without what? Talking. Yeah. Are you, did you now catch it? You are living this, you are living the principle. If you are a renter, you are living the principle of how, you are, you are living out the arrangement between God and man. Earth is mine, but the lease is yours. Earth is mine, but the list is yours. So if anything, if any spirit from the invisible world shows up on your territory, you did it. You can't blame it on God. You did it. If, if, come on somebody. Are you catching what I'm saying? What is God saying? He's saying, if, a, if an angel shows up in your house, you did it. If the Holy Ghost shows up in your life, you did it. But if the devil and his mother-in-law show up in your house. <laughs> you did it. <laughs> Are you catching what I'm saying? This is the law of dominion. So, God makes that the law. But he's locked out. But God is a genius. Are you, are you with me? So, say, so God gives man complete what? Authority. But not power. Say within, but not power. So that's why David says in the book of Psalms, twice, God has spoken it once, but twice ever heard it. That power belongs to yeah. God. Yeah. Why did God do it? Genius. Are you catching what I'm saying? So God gives you complete authority, but he retains the power. And he says, amen, you can have access to my power if you give me legal permission to work with you. Are you guys what I'm saying? Are, are you with me? Yeah. Why do you think witches are witches? It's God's. Because power remained in the invisible realm. Wow. So the devil has power. The witches have authority, but they don't have power. <laughs> so they need to exchange. They need to gamble. They need to trade. They need to trade. So the enemy, the devils wanna, want access to the world of men. The witches want access to the power of the celestial beings. I want, come on, somebody, amen. So if you are a Kenny Souza, you are a Benny Hinn, come on, and you want people to be healed in mass, you realize I don't have power to heal a pinky toe. I don't have power to heal one strand of hair. Are you catching what I'm saying? But I have something I can trade with. I have complete authority in the world of men. And, and God really wants access through me to other people who need to know him. But he's got the power. If we can just come together, come on somebody, amen. God is looking for legal right to use his power on earth legally. I could be that vessel who allows God. And then all of a sudden, our partnership, hey, I got the authority. He's got the power and we're working together. Bam. <laughs> So watch this now. So God says, so how does God bridge the two worlds, spirit and natural, without violating law? 
without vow. Remember, when God sets a law, Lucifer has no choice but to obey it. Because God's law is higher law. It's Lucifer is a celestial being. See, and, 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 and unlike these stupid teachings that we are getting in the church, because these, these people don't, don't even know what they are talking about, Satan cannot do anything that's not legal. He can't. He has to work around the laws of the kingdom. So, he just figures out, figures them out. And then, you know what's called in, in technology? Reverse engineering. Reverse engineering is when somebody ta- figures out your technology, right. reverses engineer it for their own benefit. Are you catching what I'm saying? That's what, oh, Satan Sid- is just a master reverse engineer. Finds out, okay, so, so Satan is, you know, you know, so God creates an interface. Some of that interface. interface. That you know as an, oh, now, this interface, you guys know it as an, the Bible. T- see, the Bible, uh, uh, See, the Bible, God is, 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 is such a pragmatist. When you're a pragmatist, you reduce your language to the intelligence of the generation you're writing to. If the Bible was written today, there, w- there would be no way to alter in the Bible, there would be the word interface. Because we can understand what an interface is. But trust me, somebody coming out of a, a, a cave, <laughs> cave man, you tell him interface, he's like, what? So God had to use something outside of them to symbolize something powerful in the spirit. Altars. So this thing, so, so watch this now. Are you with me? So God built an interface. Some of the interface. Between the natural and what? Okay, actually I'm going to use this. Can I use this as an example? Okay. All right. So this is, that's what an altar is. I'm going to just put this. Okay. So... This, you guys are angels. I just promise you are celestial beings. You are angels. You are, yeah, these are just the earthly people, okay? <laughs> Boo. <laughs> yes, come on, somebody. Come on, I need mine. All right. So, this realm of spirit has power. The earth realm has authority. Okay? You guys know what I'm saying? But the battle is over this territory. Okay? So both God and the angels want to get into the fight. The devil wants to get into the fight, but there's a law that says you cannot because spirits without bodies on earth are illegal unless they have found a human who's willing to come to the table to trade authority for power. And then an agreement is made. That's why you see all these movies. They show you what they do in this Hollywood. They know what they're doing. Yeah. Watch some of even Thor. There's always an altar in these movies. Watch the Marvel series. They are showing it right in front of you. Remember Wakanda? He had to go to the land of the dead. Come on. Yeah. They are telling you what they are transferring. That there's an interface between the, wor- the world of Wakanda and the world of the ancestors. Remember in Wakanda? He had to die with this plan and then come back. And the ancestors gave him power. They connect him to the power. <laughs> and then he comes back. Is Where do you think Hollywood gets those ideas from? Because they are doing it in real time. Altars are more basic to man than anything you know. They are as old as the earth itself. Altars. So God says, all right. Here's the deal, Adam. You're there. I'm here. You got authority. And I just made a law that made me illegal in your world unless you legally invite me in. You see what I'm saying? This is why fellowship with God is important. Fellowship. Okay? So God says, okay, Here's what I'm doing. I'm putting a gate to hold the spirits from this world from crossing into your world. What does God, why did God do it? Because you must understand, when Adam is being created, Lucifer has already fallen. Read your Bible. You were in Eden, the garden of God. He was already fallen. So as a loving heavenly father, 
Number one, he wants a child who can be like him in the world of men, right? God made us kings like him. He's a king. So we're kings in the earth. Am I talking to anybody? Is this good enough? Amen? I'm trying to show you how to release power in your life. Power always comes to an altar. And prayer is how you service the altar. So prayer without an altar is a waste of time. Because <laughs> you have no gate. So, watch this. So God says to Adam, you've got the power. You've got the authority. I've got the power. But I've created a way in which your world and mine can work together. But since, come on somebody. But since it's me trying to come into your world, you have the license. You are the licensing agent. My God. You are the licensing agent. Whatever you license. Oh, Jesus put it this way. Whatever you bind on earth. <laughs> he didn't say whatever God binds. God doesn't bind anything. You bind. God does not lose anything. You lose. Read your Bibles. God doesn't lose anything. If something is lost, God is like, who did it? <laughs> who on earth lose that? Who on earth bound that? Whatever you bind on earth, there will be a reciprocal reaction in heaven. In the world of men. But have you noticed there is no scripture that gives you the legal right to bind anything in heaven? Because then you are violating the law of territory. Can I repeat that? I'll tell you you are. He said, Jesus said, whatever you bind. Is that right, Pastor John? Yes. On earth. And it's very clear. See, God does not. See, what I love about the Lord, he communicates clearly. God hates misunderstandings. There's no being who desires to be understood more than God. So he loves to use simple terms, not like people like me who use big words. God loves simple terms because he wants his kids to get him. Whatever you bind on earth, so he shows you territories involved. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Heaven will have no choice but to respond because when it comes to the earth, the licensing, the complete authority was given to you. But power becomes to come, belongs to us. So if you're in a relationship, if you bind something on earth, we'll back you up with the power we have on the other, our side. That's what he's saying. Our power is a reaction to your decree. Because we have a licensing agreement between us. Are you catching what I'm saying? This is why all the people that are into witchcraft, they understand this. Are you catching what I'm saying? God is a genius. Are you with me so far? I'm, I'm trying to help you understand an altar in, a, in an American way. Am I doing, am, am I helping? <laughs> I'm trying to Americanize the altar. Because in Africa, we grow up knowing altars from the time you're a child because you see your fathers and bowing down to them and offering the priest, our, our so-called priest offering their chicken. I mean, we grew up. So for us, understanding altars is easy because, and the people in South America too, people in Mexico, it's true because they also got the same type of cultures, so they get it. It's in the American West, you really have to explain it because the altars here are sophisticated, they hide. So we have to expose them and then it's, oh my God, that's that, that's that, that's that, that. So what I was saying, sister, was this. He said, this is why you don't find a place in the Bible where a man is ever allowed to bind anything in heaven. Because you are violating the law of territory. Heaven is not yours. The, the, earth, the Bible even tells us, Psalm 115 verse 16, the heavens of heavens belong to the Lord, but the earth he has given to the children of men. So an altar, God says, this thing, this interface, this 
connective tissue, the gate between your world, our world of spirit, with your world of flesh, is going to be governed by an altar, a platform. And because it's your world that we are coming into, a man must attend to the altar. You catch what I'm saying? And that's what the altar is. It's simply a gate between the word of men and the word of spirit. I get what I'm saying. So this is why, this is why, uh, come on somebody, this is why when, when you're talking about, when, when Katie says last night, idols are nothing but what? Demon spirits. Since they are spirit, they are affected by the law of territory. <coughs> they are spirits without bodies. So, they need yours. <laughs> they need yours <clears throat> to be legal on earth. But in order for them to have a dynasty, a perpetual industry, they have to make sure the gate doesn't, that doesn't close. We are here to close the gates in your bloodline. Because if the gates close, the dynasty ends. If the gate closed, the demonic dynasty ends. That's why idols riot when we come into town. Because they are terrified because they know the gate's about to be closed. Yeah. And all of a sudden, the access that, 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 that spirit of suicide had to your bloodline will be closed. Yeah. And all of a sudden, members of your family who don't even know what you, what you did as the deliverer of the family who one day wake up and say, I don't know what it is, but today I feel different. I've been, oh, I'm always feeling depressed, feel like killing myself. All those thoughts are gone. The gate has been closed. Wow. So they are feeling different. Because the truth, is, the truth is, they did not want to kill themselves, but every spirit... Now, oh God. I'm trying to use... An, I'm, 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 I'm Americanizing this message. I'm trying to... But are you getting it so far? Give me, uh, give me uh, Genesis 8. Let me make sure my time is good. Genesis 8. Put it on the board. Genesis 8, 20 to 21. Am I doing good, honey? Very good. Hallelujah. Someone say hallelujah. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. That's African for you. Hallelujah. Sounds more powerful. Hallelujah. Okay. Are you there? Look at this. Genesis 8, 20 to 22. Watch this. As a matter of fact, let's read it together as a count of three, as loud as you can. Can we read it together? Yes. Can we do that? Because yes. I want it to get in your spirit. One, two, three, read. Then Noah built an altar to the Lord. And there sacrificed burnt offerings, the animals. Verse, the next verse. And the Lord was pleased. I will never again curse the ground because of the human race, even though everything they think or imagine is bent toward evil from childhood. I will never again destroy all living things. All living what? Things. All living what? Things. things. Now, let, now, now, now look at the next verse. When did they read? As long as the earth remains, there will be Planting and harvesting, corn and harvest, summer and winter, day and what? Night. Okay, just end on there. Remember, where is God saying this on? Where is God say See, that scripture was not spoken in the air. If you read it from the Bible, if you don't understand authors, he didn't speak it from the air because he could not. He spoke it on the interface. What is he trying to say? While the earth remains, harvest both seed, seed time and harvest time, seasons of course, every season while the earth remains will be controlled by men like Noah who built altars. Okay. I'll get it again. Do you get what I just, what I just said to you? 
He's saying why the earth remains. It's not about seed time and harvest time. This is why, uh, 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 this is what the problem with the prosperity movement. They taught that scripture without, out of context. Seed time and harvest time, and they talk about seed. So seed became everything until it was not. People are frustrated. I've sown my seed. Why is, why is there, why am I not getting my harvest? Where is the altar that controls that harvest? Because that was the reaction of God to an altar. What did Noah build? What did Noah build? And God was reacting to what? To the altar. He's saying, watch what, how powerful this gate, this altar is. If it's this powerful with God, you better believe it's that powerful with the devil. No wonder the devil craves human beings to build altars to him. Because if an altar can change the mind of God, wow. if an altar can make God say, oh, I'll change my mind. Never again. He starts vowing. Notice there is no prayer involved. No one ever prayed, never asked anything of God. Which brings us to something else. Is why? Watch this. Noah doesn't, there's no recorded prayer that he ever prayed. And I said, God, but God, why? And why did you speak that way? He said to me, that's the voice Noah's altar was making. He didn't have to make it with his mouth. Remember, he made the altar just after he came out of the flood and saw the devastation the flood had done. What do you think he came out to? Bad is running everywhere. I don't care who you are, unless you are, you're, unless you're, you are, you are heartless, you are heartless, Nephilim, which was Noah was not. When you see millions of people lying on the body uh, uh, and ravens feeding off people's flesh, it's going to break your heart. He saw the severity of God and he said, Lord, never again, don't ever do this again. I know, oh my God, is there another way for you to do your work without this? And he built an altar and the altar was speaking what was in Noah's heart. And God says, okay, I hear you, I hear you, never again. Will I ever do this again? Because Noah was looking at it. Never again will I ever do this again. And Noah, let me tell you something else. From now onwards, seed time and harvest time will be controlled by men and women on earth who build altars. You, you want to change what you are harvesting in your family, build a new altar. You tired of the depression? Build an altar to God that will swallow the depression and the harvesting will change because the earth is now controlled by men who build altars. Trust me, the witchcraft people know it better than the church. The church is always lagging behind the demonic world. They'll know it. Why do you think masons? Trust me, masons know that. He built an altar. Why? Why? Think about this. This guy has come out of 150 years of the flood. 50 days. It's been raining. Why in God's name that the first thing Noah does is not build a house? You think that's the first place you start? You just come out and or do something. The first thing he does is the most important because he now understands how God works. He comes and he builds an altar. Why did he build an altar? To negotiate with God. You can never do this again. And why did God respond to him? Because complete authority over earth was given to what? So when the man said, okay God, I'm glad my family and I survived this, but never again. God heard the man at an altar say never again. And God echoed the cry of a man, never again. If it's happening in your family, you are the only one who has the power to say, never again. Not on my watch. And God says, okay, not on your watch. Nobody, nobody in my family will ever die young ever again. Not on my watch. And God said, okay, you get, you, this is exciting. What are you going to do about it? I'm going to build an altar to God. Come on, someone. And I, I'm, I'm willing to put the sacrifice on it. It will take to make sure nobody in my family. Remember, whatever you ask God on an altar will cost you. Because an altar is a, an exchange. 
like Wall Street. <laughs> God, God hears you pray. So you know what prayers, prayers are? Is you telling God what you're willing to pay for. <laughs> That's all praise. Telling God, God, I want the blind to be healed. I'm tired of blame. And God says, we is is, is that, Gabriel, come here, Gabriel. He Maybe he's asking the, the, uh, the eye angel who controls all the eyeballs in heaven. Come here, come here, come here. Because there's purpose for everything. How much do eyes cost? <laughs> why, why are you asking, Lord? My daughter wants to have a lot of eye miracles. We need to find what price she has to pay on the altar for us to give her eyeballs all her life. Because an altar is a place of exchange. That's why they sacrificed at altars. Why? Because the sacrifice was the payment for what was in the spirit world. That's why some of you want God to give you a, make you a multi-millionaire, but every time you come to give an offering, it's your $10. He cannot buy that lifestyle in the other world. God says you keep, you keep coming up short. You keep bringing to the altar. What, that's why God will say, if I am a father, he tells in Malachi, if I am your father, if I am your our God, where is my honor? I don't care what you say. I look at what comes on the altar. He says, you bring on the altar blemished, blemished animals, animals you wouldn't even give to your governor and you sacrifice them to me and you think I can exchange them for power, you are fools. That's what he's saying. If you understand altars, you understand every complaint of God in the Bible. It's like, I don't care what you say. That's why he said, your lips move, but your hearts are far from me because I don't investigate your heart by your mouth. I investigate your heart by what's on the altar because that's what's real. You give your television seven hours of a day of, of watching it, you give me seven minutes. That's all that's on the altar. Oh, Lord, I love you. No, you love me for seven minutes. Because I don't care what you say, I'm listening to the altar because altars speak. And every altar speaks. The altar, every altar is marked by the sacrifice of the attendant. God can come, even demons. That's what, what you think in the witchcraft realm. The devil keeps asking for more sacrifices from witches who want to have more power. And Hollywood is showing you in movies. What do you think the conjuring? All these movies are yeah, showing you what they are doing. What do you think COVID was about? It's these globalist cabal who are into witchcraft, witchcraft, trying to have the next level of dominion on earth, and suddenly saying, I need more blood. And they came up with a virus to give him more blood. Everything is about altars. Have you noticed how some people who, 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 head, who head the church, the sense of the church, have become billionaires through COVID because that blood sacrifice was theirs, not yours. So your voice has been masked, muffled, silenced, and theirs is more powerful because they, were, they, are, they are put on that altar, blood that is speaking, a high sacrifice, and God is saying, what, what are you going to put on mine to counteract the COVID sacrifice? Well, you know, you're still you're five minutes a day. Your team is a day, oh, that, that, that won't deal with what the, that won't even come close to touching the kind of power these guys now have. Because they've given to the devil everything he needed on his order. His order is filled with the blood of men. They were willing to, they were willing to, they were willing to become animals, kill people for more power. They knew what they were doing. They knew it came from a lab. They knew they invented it. They knew all oh, this was a lie. But if this is what it costs for the devil to give them more power and more money, that's what they did. And God is saying tonight, what are you going to do? on my altar to counteract the power they now have. Your five minutes of prayer, your five dollar offering, is going to deal with the kind of power these guys are working in? You are a joke. Am I talking to anybody? <laughs>